our planet is transforming under by products directly traceable back to us, humans. We have polluted the oceans through sewage and ocean acidification. And that's not the tip of the many melting icebergs of climate problems on Earth, to say the very least. We have a responsibility on this planet to protect what once ruled over our world, even before we laid eyes on it long ago. To protect the beings some love dearly, and the beings others seek to understand. To protect life itself and its progress, which has continued through numerous years prior to our own existence. That is what needs to be accomplished with coral reefs. The pollution I speak of, which actively affects coral reefs, every passing moment comes from sewage, which reaches 58% of our coral reefs. The process of water turning into literal acid, which I spoke of earlier in this introduction, is a result of warming temperatures around the world thanks to us and our admissions. Along with the high air amount of CO2, carbon dioxide, across Earth's oceans, which has thus triggered an ocean-wide change in the landscape. Climate change in the present day has greatly affected coral reefs, however, there is a chance to save them. Coral reefs in recent years have experienced massive occurrences of bleaching due to humanitarian and environmental factors. The ecological damage is deafening to a person like me who has witnessed catastrophe across millions of years. And in this video, I will discuss coral reefs and how they developed throughout the fossil record, how they work today across our waters, and where they mainly occur on the planet. Hello, my name is Atrix, and welcome to my channel. I am the guardian of the natural order, and this is Coral Reefs. Our story begins at the early days of the marine fossil record, with a period known as the Ediacaran. Here, the first organisms that can resemble our coral reefs of today appear. These were known as the Claudinidae, which are composed of Claudina and Conotubus. They existed on the latter end of the Ediacaran around 550 million years ago going extinct at the turn of the Cambrian Explosion, which began the Paleozoic Era. These strange animals from a largely mysterious time have been handled the classification of Incertidae Cetus or Plobermatica, making their exact relationships hard to truly define amongst other invertebrates and other animals at large. Many scientists have attempted to further classify the cloud eyed day and to more exact terms, however, this has been proven difficult. These have been considered coral like before, possessing certain features which may lean to this theory, such as a mineralized skeleton and largely being shell like. However, there are organisms with some of the oldest gut contents in the entire fossil record, suggesting a different ancient lineage possibly more in line with segmented worms, dubbed annelids. Animals such as the odd Claudina chrysand into binomial nomenclature within 1984 gives the name of its family, having a signature calcareous or calcium carbonate based cone structure as an organism. It furthermore acts as an index fossil, serving as an important marker for the Ediacaran period within biostratigraphy. The identifications of rock layers based on fossil remains. Members of the Cloud Day are usually found in shallow waters, also in relation to sedimentary grained bacterial based formations dubbed stromatolites, which have been found in places such as Australia and western Chile to this day, with extinct ones being found in such places like Glacier National Park in Montana, Cloud Idene members alone have been discovered in places worldwide such as Nambia, Canada, Brazil, and the state of Nevada within the United States of America. 
moving away from the time of the Ediacaran, we come into the lower early Cambrian beginning around 541 million years ago, give or take. Here we start to see some of the true oldest reef building animals unlike the cloud eyed Nidae family, which were merely aggregations. These stationary creatures are dubbed as the taxon Archaeocyathids, which translates to ancient cups. These are non-moving reef building organisms, as recognized as another important index fossil for a specific time in the beginnings of the Paleozoic's Lower Cambrian period, being stage 2 of the Terranovian series, the first of the Paleozoic era altogether. They continued into the following stage 3 during the small beginnings of the Middle Cambrian. This time coincides with the first appearance of trilobites, and like coral reefs, archaeocyathids are mostly carbonate based. By the same time, they also suffered a sharp decline in populations, with the last of these peculiar sea critters disappearing by the end of the Cambrian geological period altogether. This was maybe possible due to the iron thumb of an increasing sponge family, which makes up 72.6% of all sponges today, dubbed the Desmo sponges. And the average coastal shallow sea dwelling archaeocyathid resembled one of the two extinct coral families known to have inhabited Earth, with a hollow cup shape with openings around the stiffened walls, kinda like ice cream cones. These openings controlled ultimately how much that given archaeocyathid could consume and as they would feed on different forms of plankton. This gives us a fascinating look into reef building animal evolution as there is a majority of scientists suggesting a position which lies more towards sponges rather than coral today. However, as these archaic mysterious forms receded, Coming into the following period after the Cambrian, known as the Ordovician, were two extinct coral families, the Tabulate Corals and the Rugose Corals. The first of the two now extinct coral types is known as the Tabulate Corals, which a little before the prior mentioned Rugose Corals. The Tabulate Corals are defined as the subclass of Tabulata and are largely defined by a presence across the Paleozoic era, first appearing in the Ordovician period, with the Rugos corals falling shortly after. The tabulata is further defined as colonial organisms, made up of individual hexagonal cells within a skeleton of chalcite. Tabulate corals are usually smaller than Rugos corals and range considerably in shape across the 300 species described attributed to the classification of Tabulata. One such common genus under Tabulata I own is Favocytes. I have a coral head of one from my geological collection. As a part of a tabulate coral reef, they would be concentrated in shallow waters, primarily in the Silurian period, the period after they first appear, and the Devonian period, which is when my coral head belonging to the Favocytes genus was around. Tabulate corals are good indicators ecologically and geologically since they start to disappear in the Devonian due to rising sea levels and because they're restricted to the Paleozoic era. This makes them good index fossils, which in turn are used to correlate geological time. The second of the two extinct coral types which were mentioned earlier are the Rugos corals, sometimes nicknamed the Horn corals. Moreover, the Rugos corals, like the previously discussed tabulate corals, are restricted to the Paleozoic era. However, they differ in their own right. The Rugos corals are benthic, deep water dwelling coral, which is a contrast from the shallow dwelling tabulate corals. Furthermore, the Rugos corals, like the tabulate corals, are colonial and have a skeleton made of calcite. However, they differ again in lifestyle. 
grew ghost corals regardless of being colonial critters like most corals extinct and extant, they are more solitary due to each individual coral and a reef being more separate individually speaking, requiring extra support simultaneously from other corals in the area as a rugos coral reef. Rugos corals, furthermore, are ecologically referred to as microcarnivores based on the large sizes they can approach individually, sometimes one meter in length, and the presence of tentacles to catch tiny prey. Some paleontologists have further inferred from their remains that they also had stinging cells, however, this is a feature more up for debate. Eventually, as the fossil record dictates, by the end of the Permian, a catastrophic event that occurred in Earth's geological history wiped out both lineages of coral disgust. This Armageddon of an event dubbed the Great Dying had a chaotic reign 252 million years ago, before the dinosaurs, effectively rendering the Rugos corals and Tybalit corals extinct. This is expected as this extinction event from the end of the Paleozoic era was the worst dealt to all marine life on planet Earth at that time, eradicating 81% of all marine species. Together, both the Rugos and Horn corals are preserved in limestone or in calcareous shale, the latter being composed of much more calcium carbonate CaCO3, allowing the preservation of corals to take place largely in the first place. Life, however, finds a way outside of the fossils we see, and its progress picking up where it left off in the beginning of the Mesozoic era with the Triassic period. These are where our extant corals of today's Holocene epoch come into being, referred to here as the Stony Corals. They first appeared in the middle of the Triassic period and became officially commonplace amongst the marine environments by Jurassic times, the following period after the Triassic. So since we're finally here with the comprehensive yet sort of brief overview of coral natural history, how do they live and work within a marine ecosystem today during the Holocene epoch? Our extant corals aren't made of calcite, but instead are made of aragonite. This is tricky geologically since the mineral of CaCO3, calcium carbonate, doesn't preserve as well as other minerals in the form of aragonite. However, that's not a concerning issue seeing how our coral reefs and stony coral, which first appeared in the Middle Triassic, are still relatively intact today. However, their fossil remains, regardless during the Mesozoic, remains patchy at best. Moving away from the deep past to now in the Holocene epoch, we know a lot about the biology of coral reefs today. Aside from a hard skeleton like the other forms spoken of in this video, modern day coral are either solitary or colonial, sharing relationships with other interesting critters. These critters which make up our coral are known as polyps, which connect to each other through a system of organs such as the holdfast, which are used to anchor corals and other beings like it onto the sea floor. Moreover, the asexual reproduction methods of coral rely on these polyps. The process includes secreting calcium carbonate, CaCO3 mentioned earlier, and a budding method via cell division, forming a network of polyps as a colony. The shape and appearance of modern day coral reefs can be quite variable. Since this depends on factors like the geographical location, depth at where the corals exist, as we've seen in the extinct tablet horn corals, and even the amount of water movement can decide the type of coral you see in a body of water. Corals in the modern day are also closely related to sea anemones, which are marine predators with stinging cells. They appear amongst corals as they populate across the five oceans of our planet, appearing in tropical waters, even freezing waters, but today there are largely two kinds of corals which are distinguished from the ecological settings mentioned. There are hermatypic corals, which 
again reside in tropical shallow waters and ahermatypic corals, which echo the rugos corals since they're more solitary. They also vary from habitat to habitat, able to exist in temperate seasonal changing waters, polar waters, or at depths up to 2,000 feet. This shows the long journey coral has made starting from the Mesozoic era, and now, our modern-day corals face a threatening situation in which their future is expected to get more grim as time progresses. As humanity has progressed over their course across the Holocene Epoch, we have made many technological advancements, however there are still many which directly harm the environment more than peacefully coexist at this time. This is because of the absurd amount of pollution which is shot into the air across many sources. The gas from these fossil fuel emissions at the source of some pollution, known as carbon dioxide or CO2, has greatly affected not just the atmosphere of the earth by raising the carbon dioxide content, but has also greatly affected the world's oceans. This change in climate in the form of warming temperatures has also resulted in a cruel twin, ocean acidification. This is something which is harming coral reefs around the planet, the result of 150 billion metric tons of carbon being absorbed. Corals are essential for maintaining marine ecosystems, providing fish with vital food supplies. This includes various commercial types fishermen rely on as well as salmon. This process of ocean acidification has subsequently changed the chemistry of Earth's oceans, and has affected the coral reefs directly in how they reproduce, appear, and maintain in health, and durability in mineral structure. Key pollutants mentioned earlier which contribute to the feedback given from fossil fuels and deforestation ripping the life out of Mother Nature's lungs. Understand how carbon dioxide CO2 is not necessarily a bad thing. Understand that it's amplified unnecessarily by us and our civilization we have built. It plays a key role in many natural events, like volcanoes, forest fires, and geysers. It's one of the primary sources of life across this planet we call home. So then what are we to do exactly in the face of this deadly coral reef situation? Scientists are on the case in the form of tuning the coral phenotype, which is a biological term referring to an animal's physical traits and appearance, to resist warmer temperatures. By playing with the expressions of genes and thus manipulating molecular mechanisms, scientists have very well possibly come across a possible plan. Many humans across planet Earth have expressed deep concern for the health and preservation of our currently extant coral reefs, wishing possibly that they never want to see such sea critters join the fossil record like the past instances in the Paleozoic. However, with the power to do so in the hands of the right people are paramount. Recently, I've been getting more invested into environmental science with the progression towards our sixth mass extinction being become more prevalent. With the money I have, I have donated $50 to the Wildlife Conservation Society headquartered in New York City, my hometown. I've been to the Bronx Zoo on occasion, loving every animal I saw, reminded of me of why this world is so wonderful to be in the first place. Thanks for watching.